The next topic will be with Dr. Nasser Bakhshi, hematopathology consultant in King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. When I think of something uh, as a <coughs> review, review course, I, uh, I think something really exhaustive material and uh, covering the topic really thoroughly. That's what I had in mind when I prepared this talk. <coughs> and uh, for some reason, unfortunately, we're not able to give you handouts in advance, which should have taken place and uh, facilitated your understanding. And uh, I mean, going through the whole lecture, uh, I got some 120 slides. So, so bear with me, we'll, we'll fly through them. But uh, as I said, you have, we will have the access to the notes. So you will try to refer to them, inshallah, at the end of the top, at the end of the, uh, this uh, session. I think Haisam is going to make sure that you get the files, right, inshallah. Okay, so I have two uh, major topics to cover during this one hour. And the first I'm going to uh, cover is uh, chronic lymphoproliferative neoplasms, both B and T cell types. So <coughs> you uh, understand all the basics. I'm not going to going through the sort of the um, the sort of giving you the classification at this point because we already kind of assume that you know that and you have some understanding of the classification from the WHO. Uh, so if you uh, kind of look at this is the outline of my talk for the first part and it's going to cover all the B cell and T cell uh, chronic lymphoproliferative neoplasms which involve the blood. So I do understand all of your hematologists you do not uh, treat lymphoma or, or, or you know, see lymphoma much. So I am restricted here to the conditions which involve the peripheral blood particularly. And these are the ones I think you should know and you probably will come across during your practice in future. <coughs> so by definition, uh, the B cell, running for proliferative neoplasm, we deal with B cell first and then the T cells. Uh, they're clonal, they're mature, and uh, they're supposed to have low proliferative rate, although this is not always true. And they always uh, have prolonged survival compared to the aggressive uh, neoplasms, which say it's large cell lymphoma or percutaneous lymphoma. Uh, w when we try to approach a so similar approach for all these conditions, and that includes clinical, you know, age, physical examination, CBC, morphology set of stepwise approach. Um, I will go through one by one uh, through the, the, all these conditions. Uh, the immunophenotype is very critical in identifying or segregating them into different categories. So without that, it's nearly impossible. As you'll see, there is a lot of overlap with the morphology, a lot of these conditions. As for the incidence, this is one of the latest uh, uh, slides from Dr. Foucault's uh, collection. And according to that, CLL is the commonest, but I mean, you can debate about this figure because in, in the West, CLL is of course the commonest, but in Saudi Arabia and other you know, Middle Eastern countries, we don't have really figures, but it's supposedly not as common as we see uh, CLL is, um, in the US you will see every week at least five, six cases. So here it's not as common. Um, then hairy cell leukemia, uh, then all these sort of uh, lymphomas involving the peripheral blood, like mantle cells, splenic marginal zone lymphoma, and then more rarer ones are the problem lymphocytic leukemias and the other leukemic disorders we're going to touch briefly in this talk. CLL is, uh, is common and it's also important that you realize that it's not seen in earlier age group. I've seen some of the residents trying to make a diagnosis of CLL in children. I mean, I guess novices and new residents, but it's really uncommon, almost unheard of uh, to have uh, CLL in <coughs> young age. Most of them occur in late age groups, and it's seemingly more common in males than females. But you know, again, it's you know, we can see equally here in uh, males as well as females. We have seen a lot of female CLLs. <coughs> so the pathogens is, is, is kind of uh, now becoming more and more clear as we understand a lot of things, including the microRNAs, and the B cell receptor complex. And this has become really uh, critical in our new therapies that we started to offer to patients with CLL. Again, these are tried and tested in, in, in Western countries, including US. And here, um, 
it's not as common so we kind of rely on some more older therapies and something you know uh, which is sort of more common and uh, I guess more sort of uh, used in, in the past so I'll, I'll briefly touch about those um, so the microenvironment also picks important role so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on pathogenesis which is briefly I will just uh, allude to this figure uh, this is something I think you should also kind of try to understand again this is the B cell receptor complex and this is the uh, this immunoglobulin molecule and then this adjoining molecules which are the CD79A and then the uh, the, the pathways relate linked to the different sort of uh, transcription factors and these are very critical nowadays like the mTOR uh, PI3K pathway uh, PKC pathway and uh, the NF kappa B and finally the BCL2 pathway in the mitochondria uh, why is this important because uh, nowadays you probably have heard of a lot of these medications these are becoming uh, more and more sort of uh, uh, trials are being done and they're being offered in patients as second line you know uh, on re refractory CLLs and also in, in cases actually front line because of the very low side effects like Brutinab, you must have heard about it. It's a BTK inhibitor. It's offered as frontline in a lot of cases uh, who would otherwise probably fail um, to um, the FCR regimen, which is really uh, intense. So I think uh, I would recommend uh, to go over the figure carefully and see the diagram um, sort of details in, in the ASH book 2013. And this is, this is really critical for understanding the new therapies, especially for the clinical uh, residents. Um, before we go to CLL as a disease, uh, there is this entity monoclonal B lymphocytosis. I think all of you probably know about it. It's been in for since the WHO classification in 2008 came out. Um, basically, it's just a precursor of CLL and it's just uh, the uh, similar situation that we have in MGUS with the myeloma. And um, it's not really clear where the borderline can be drawn. There's an arbitrary count of 5,000 monoclonal B cells, but you know people have their sort of reservations about that number. And uh, uh, there's, as I said, a lot of overlap. The one important thing is um, when SLL, which is the lymphoma involving the lymph nodes without involving the peripheral blood, uh, you can have a small amount of monoclonal B cells in the peripheral blood. So in those cases, if you just look at the peripheral blood and, and do the flow and you see monoclonal B cells like 2000, it won't satisfy their definition for CLL, but you should also not call it MBL because patient already has SLL. And so you have to take in context what the history is, the clinical condition is. Uh, without that, uh, you should probably not just uh, you know, use the definition of MBL or monoclonal B lymphocytosis. <clears throat> And they progress, as I said, these are precursors with similar rate as MGUS in myeloma. Important, uh, same steps involve uh, analyzing and uh, studying these diseases, clinical hemogram, morphology, and bone marrow. Important is the sustained monoclonal B lymphocytosis. Uh, they say three months, again, this is not really restricted. And the number of uh, clonal B cells should be uh, more than 5,000 per WHO definition. And uh, morphologically, all of you have seen CLLs in our routine uh, workups of these cases. And uh, the pattern of infiltration of bone marrow has its diagnostic importance. We're going to touch it uh, in our talk briefly. Uh, this is the picture uh, we're all familiar with. And what I kind of allude here is this uh, the chromatin, which is broken apart and very hyper uh, mature with sort of uh, cracks in between also called cracked mud soccer ball chromatin so this is a very well-known morphologic appearance and don't pay attention to cytoplasm usually uh, nc ratio is quite high another interesting and common finding is the presence of smudge cells which are uh, one of the diagnostic hallmarks but don't base diagnosis on smudge cells for example if you have a preparation which is done on an albumin slide you might not find smudge cells so we get to know that smudge cells are actually preparation artifacts nothing more than that you can see them in other uh, rapidly proliferating neoplasms too so in the context of seeing these cells and smudge cells then CLL becomes very obvious 
uh, the way it's infiltrating the bone marrow, a lot of uh, questions are asked whether we really need the bone marrow to diagnose it. Actually, no, we don't because it's just done by peripheral blood count and the immunophenotype. There is some value, though, prognostic value for the bone marrows, and one of them uh, we'll talk about the uh, <clears throat> progression to high grade lymphomas or transformations. That's another value, but before that, the way it infiltrates the bone marrow is, has been. Um, studied and it has been shown that if it's a nodule infiltrate it's good and that somehow seems to relate with ZAP17 negativity which is also a good prognostic uh, sort of type of CLL and if it's 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 diffuse infiltrate uh, rather than nodular and that supposedly has a poor outcome and correlates well with ZAP70 positivity so more prognostic value than diagnosis. Um, again, immunophenotype, all of you have very familiar with, so I'm not going to spend too much time. Um, just I have listed the importance of the different groups of phenotypes that we have uh, for CLL. Most important is that we have to have mature marker, maturity marker of the B cell, which is the surface immunoglobulin. Again, I must have mentioned before, but if I didn't, the intensity of these markers is also important. It's just not positive, negative. We have to really <coughs> qualify them and say whether it's peak intensity, moderate intensity, and strong intensity because um, that can differentiate between, say, uh, mantle cell lymphoma versus CLL. Because CLL is supposedly weak surface immunoglobulin expression. <clears throat> then we have, again, weak expression of CD20 and CD22, and negative, rather, or low expression of CD79A. And there's co-expression of these two markers which are normally not seen in uh, regular B cells. CD5 in particular is very diagnostic in presence of a surface immunoglobulin for CLL in a given context. And then also absence of these markers, especially CD10, FMC7, 11C, and I, I already mentioned 79A. So uh, see, this is all put together, not just to use one single marker. And for prognostic purposes, these are also flow markers, CDs 38 and ZAP70. ZAP70 can also be done by immunohistochemistry. chemistry. So these are prognostic, so not necessarily for diagnosis. But <clears throat> so these are two given cases. Do not pay attention to the colors, just the circles are your cells of interest. And you can see this is a lambda, sort of a dim lambda restriction. And with CD23 expression and co-expression of CD5 and dimmer CD20. And then if uh, you are looking for CD38 uh, expression, you have to see the abnormal cell population is expressing CD38 because what happens, CD38 is actually an activation marker and a lot of T cells would normally express CD38. So it doesn't get kind of any expression of CD39 is not of love, sort of enough. You have to see it is the right cells in this case is the abnormal CD5 expressing uh, B cells, which are CD38 positive, and that means that this is CD38 positive CLL, means it is poor outcome type CLL. And uh, as for the survival goes, and this is really in interesting, one third of the patients, they do very well. You don't give them therapy They're early RI stages. Uh, one and zero, and they can have long survival as, as good as normal people, at that age, they usually have other diseases, so they usually die of something else rather than CLL. And uh, some patients <coughs> may have prolonged sur survival, but eventually develop into, um, you know, uh, generalized disease and, and progress to high-grade lymphomas. And uh, some are aggressive upfront from the beginning, and those cases you have to treat. And those, those, this is the whole crux of sorting out those one-third of patients, which might behave aggressively at the beginning. So you want to have some way of figuring out whether this case will behave aggressively or not. So I mentioned ZAP2, ZAP, ZAP70 and CD38, but there are other markers we want to talk about. And this is how uh, the prognostic, I mean, this is the list, which is not really too exhaustive. And if you open ASH book, let books and other journals, you'll find many, many more markers being discussed. Not all of them are really uh, validated or sort of used clinically. Some of them are just being tested, some are experimental, but these are the ones I believe have some value. Uh, also mentioned, we'll, we'll talk about genetic findings uh, in that. Um, thymidine kinase uh, as a serum marker and beta-2 microglobulin have, have also been validated and found to be very closely related to the outcome. One of the most important, actually, the um, marker which kind of 
everything seems to boil down to this, which is the IG, uh, I mean, global heavy chain sort of uh, variable region heavy chain gene arrangement. And if it is mutated, it's supposedly good prognosis. Unmutated tend to do bad. So what it means unmutated is, is these are naive, uh, sort of derived. Uh, older times used to call naive CLL, and those actually have a poor outcome. And how we do it? We do it by <coughs> PCR. We look for the homology of the IV, uh, IGHV, and if it's more than 2%, that means it's mutated. And if it's mutated, as I said, it carries a very good prognosis, uh, up to you know 300 plus month survival, median survival. It also correlates with uh, CD38 and ZAP70, but not always. So these can be used as surrogate markers because they're easy to do, uh, but uh, the purists always would reflect back to IGH, hey, very variable region uh, gene arrangement uh, to see if this is there or not. Uh, and I would say not not many centers actually do in real really uh, offer this test because it's a little bit uh, time consuming and needs a good uh, dedicated molecular laboratory to perform it. Um, yeah, it's been documented uh, many times, many many sort of papers have shown that this is this is the case that ZAP2, IGH, variable region and CD38 have good prognostic value and should be used. For the uh, <coughs> fish and other you know cytogenetic studies I think uh, I have listed these five markers which maybe there could be more but these are the critical ones um, and they have these have been linked to different things like uh, deletion of 13q is linked to good prognosis outcome in CLL unlike in, in uh, myeloma trisomy 12 has been linked to atypical morphology and atypical phenotype uh, deletion 11q which is the ATM gene has been linked to a poor outcome and so SP53, which is the deletion of 17P, has been linked to chemo resistance actually and advanced stage. And we can also do uh, micro uh, micro RNA uh, mutations, which uh, seem to somehow relate to, to the, uh, the the beginning of the disease, uh, which starts with the deletion 13Q. Actually, is a micro RNA itself. It's a micro RNA deletion or loss of the um, uh, tumor suppressor gene. Okay. Uh, so again, it has been clearly shown that different genetic, uh, different genetic uh, uh, alterations have, have, have an effect on prognosis, and this is very clearly demonstrated in this paper uh, in a New England Journal, but subsequent papers also really confirm this. And as of now, we also offer all of these tests, plus maybe a couple of more, so to help the decision making, especially if a person has, uh, say, deletion 17P, which would be really an aggressive refractory disease, so you need to really tailor your therapy according to the type of the genetic alteration. Something really, um, we haven't seen much, but uh, this sometimes come, comes up. We see a case which looks typical CLL, or phenotype and morphologies like this. So you end up calling this atypical, and these supposedly, again, are associated with poor outcome. And so there has been some correlation with, with, with the P53 deletion in, in atypical CLL. I don't usually use this term, but uh, th that's that's probably how to use sometimes when such situation like this. This these cells don't look CLL at all. As you remember, they, the, the typical CLL probably one or two cells are here, but others are so so difficult to categorize as CLL. <clears throat> so, in key things, CLL is to distinguish CLL from monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, and uh, it just provide a prognosis, not just the diagnosis in these cases. I think that's I think more than enough for CLL. Oh, sorry, there is transformation. So we know that CLL can transform to high-grade lymphomas, and common ones is prolymphocytic transformation and large cell uh, lymphoma. Rictors, everybody knows rictors, but we don't really see it that much. It's not sort of because CLLs have you know sort of now good therapies, and most of them are covered very well, and chances of finding a large cell lymphoma transformation are kind of going down and down. But there are some rare variants of transformation. I've listed them here, and I've seen some Burkitt lymphoma coming out from CLL. Interestingly, we've seen uh, sometimes Hodgkin lymphoma coexist with CLL, and this is due to most likely, rather, is due to uh, the EBV infection, which these patients harbor. And this is the large cell transformation. Uh, there's no doubt about it. This doesn't look CLL at all. 
So once you find this thing and patient will be presenting with an aggressive sort of course, high LDH and large lymph nodes, low counts. So that clinical picture should be pretty clear. And then the morphology will be like this. And this is large cell transformation. <coughs> So prolymphocytic leukemia is quite uncommon. I think we had a case some maybe three, four weeks ago, which we couldn't fit in anything. So we had to call it prolymphocytic leukemia. And this can be de novo or it can be subsequent to a CLL. And we showed it's one of the transformation pathways for CLL. Um, so uh, it's dif differentiated basically from CLL by both morphology and immunophenotype. And this is the prolymphocyte for you. And these are bigger cells have less uh, sort of the NC ratio is, is not as high because there's more cytoplasm and uh, usually or almost invariably you will find a prominent nucleolus and, and the chromatin is not like a blast it's more clumped so these are again sort of very diagnostic cells you should miss them uh, you'll see some CLLs having some of these cells but the number is not that high it's when it's just the only cell type and these present with splenomegaly and different clinical course then you have to call a prolymphocytic leukemia and they are not typically CD5 positive but they, they are just like non-specific you know mature B-cell marker. Um, interestingly uh, we are really reluctant to give a diagnosis of uh, prolymphocytic leukemia outrightly because in the past a lot of these cases actually have ended up being actually mental cell lymphomas in morning peripheral blood and also that has been proven by doing genetic studies for 11-14 translocation and also uh, some of them actually turn out to be atypical CLLs you know with trisomy 12 so again goes back to like we talked, talked about yesterday about these uh, cytogenetic markers being the real surrogate indicators of disease without the morphological counterpart so that can happen in CLL a case is trisomy 12 diagnosis by cytogenetics you probably uh, you're looking at CLL rather than some mental cell lymphoma or a problem with leukemia. So that's kind of quite diagnosed. Similar ATM deletion 13. So these are kind of supposedly not only prognostic but have a diagnostic value as well. We go to hairy cell leukemia and uh, again same pattern, clinical hem hemogram morphology. Again, I'm not going to go into more details because a lot of these things you will be reading from the notes. I'm trying to make in more sort of uh, you know. Uh, covering the topic rather than going into detail and I'll try to hit the high points uh, well, most important thing actually you need to remember is that the morphology of the cells may be a little deceptive you may not be able to find those uh, the fine projections in the hairy processes so you look at the chromatin pattern which is called a spongy chromatin uh, I'll show you some pictures and uh, and then also the pattern of infiltration the bone marrow is very important to identify uh, the hairy cell leukemia and typically these patients do not present lymphadenopathy that's kind of against a diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia sometimes hairy cell leukemia has uh, oddly been associated with large b cell lymphoma so there is and hairy cell leukemia can transfer into large b cell lymphoma so think something which presents with, with sort of uh, lymph node enlargement don't totally dismiss hairy cell leukemia because hairy cell leukemia could be there in the background and then patient could have if you have all the features, immunophenotype and morphology of hericyl leukemia, it still is hericyl leukemia, no matter if the lymph nodes are large. So that has happened, um, but typically lymph nodes are not enlarged in hericyl leukemia. Uh, the newest thing uh, is the BRAF mutations in all cases of hericyl leukemia, so it becomes the defining genetic marker for hericyl leukemia now. These are the cells, as, as you can nicely relate, these are, these are called the sponge chromatin appearance and they have sort of little bean like projections or indentations and sometimes they can be straight and these hairy processes kind of have to be really careful identifying because a lot of times it's the it's the staining which may make it hard for you to identify them so it's nicely stained and you have to look and they, they are also very few they're not uh, like abundant in the peripheral blood so really have to look for them they're not going to come to you so you have to find them and very important other part is the diffuse we mentioned about CLL being more nodular versus diffuse and you know interstitial all sort of patterns but in hairy cell it has to be diffuse cannot have a nodular infiltrate in hairy cell that is against diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia and this is the type of uh, typical case of hairy cell where you will have this so-called fried egg, fried egg appearance and all this oh, this open and um, white areas or pale zones are all due to the hairy projections which form the sort of limits of the cytoplasm and they're sort of 
blend with the adjoining cytoplasm giving you the space around these nuclei. <coughs> Uh, immunophenotype, I, I won't discuss it. You already know m most of the important markers, but uh, there are some important caveats you need to remember when you're doing the immunohistochemistry, and we had some really interesting cases lately. Uh, that come markers that have been def kind of been so supposedly very specific. Well, nothing is really specific, but these kind of had to be used in combination in good context. Annexin 1, uh, but you have to be careful because myeloid cells can also be positive. So if you have a case like this the previously I showed you and there's no myeloid cells there so this is really um, hairy cell leukemia expressing annexin 1 so is 123 another marker but dendritic cells can also show so be careful interpreting it DBA44 is, uh, is another sort of specific marker of hairy cell but sometimes only subset will show TRAP is uh, usually done immunocytochemistry but there are no immunomarkers available so you don't have to rely on the technologist, you know, doing the stain sting in two days. So this is something now easy to do on a biopsy. Interestingly, cyclin D1, which was once thought to be very specific for mantle cell lymphoma, can be seen in a lot of cases of hairy cell leukemia and doesn't really rule out the diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia. And uh, just uh, to go over the stains again, this is the um, <coughs> probably a spleen section and CD20 is strongly expressed. TRAP is positive by immuno. TBET is another marker, nuclear staining, sort of um, partial expression is seen. This is annexin 1 and uh, cyclin D1. Uh, yesterday it was alluded to about the hypercellular hairy cell leukemia as a differential diagnosis of aplastic anemia and myelodysplastic syndrome. It's really important that we kind of keep this in mind when we are looking at hypercellular marrows uh, because uh, some hairy cell leukemias can be hypercellular, you could miss the diagnosis. So anytime you are in doubt, you're not sure, just throw in CD20 antibody, it's going to light up those B cells and that's going to be good enough for you. And then you follow up with other markers specific of hairy cells. So many times this gets missed. And this is how uh, one of the cases of hairy cell leukemia, very few of these diagnosis cells were present in the peripheral blood. But then when we did the markers, we were really clear that this is a case of hairy cell leukemia. And then you can do this trap and DBA44. Okay, now we move to another category. This is the uh, splenic follicle. Everybody knows how splenic follicle looks like. Just to recapitulate for you, this is the germ, sorry, the germinal center, very similar to what we see in the lymph node. Around it is the mantle zone, the darker layer, and after the mantle zone comes the marginal zone. Uh, very important that marginal zone is the is, is the very nice and nice nicely delineated in spleen and lymph nodes. It's not easy to identify. In fact, it's the it's the biggest zone seen in the uh, in the spleen. And uh, this is something called the um, pencillary artery, which is usually uh, located at sort of a more um, away from the center polar area. And this is where the T cells are going to be. The T cells are cuffing around this this artery so the rest of it is all B cells so just to keep this in mind when you're trying to understand the disease that come out from spleen we're going to be mostly focusing on the splenic type marginal zone lymphoma okay so there are three types of marginal zone lymphoma one is the extranodal marginal zone lymphoma of the malt type which are you know seen in GI most commonly but can be seen in other areas of the body and then the second is the lymph the nodal which is the least common but what we are interested in is splenic uh, marginal zone lymphoma which can be a tough uh, you know if you don't know about it or you kind of you know looking for a hairy cell markers are not fitting then then you'd have to you know know about these 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 entities I, I know they're very rare but you still have to uh, know about them and um, this is a sort of nutshell about marginal zone lymphoma splenomegaly has to be there and many times if you actually remove the spleen these patients do very well a lot of times bone marrow is is involved actually majority of the times it's involved again it does not make it a poor prognostic entity it still has good outcome uh, because you know bone marrow spleen is connected through the sinusoid so it's not really surprising and marker wise there's nothing really specific again you have to take everything into consideration rule out hairy cell rule out mental cell rule out CLL rule out follicular then you basically uh, have the picture of splenomegaly peripheral circulating you know cells I'm going to show you a few a very interesting genet genotype has been reported and uh, it is actually uh, the 7q 
T1, just for your information. And it has been associated with as blank margin zone lymphoma. And there are many, many, many other associations that are a big topic. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about this. A uh, lot of Italian groups and European studies have shown that there's a very strong association of HCV, hepatitis C virus, with splenic marginal zone lymphoma. So I'm not going to allude to here because I think that's kind of debatable. A lot of the uh, American workers are not really satisfied or happy uh, calling that association really a uh, true association. So this, but there's something. HCV with Hispanic marginal zone lymphoma. And this is how the cells look like. There is some sort of uh, lymphocytosis, sort of not a major lymphocytosis, but you'll see increased compared to, we know, hairy cell leukemia, typically presents with low counts. And these are what the cells would look like with polar projections. Again, not very specific, but quite helpful. If you find these cells, it would kind of uh, lead you towards diagnosis of SMZL. And uh, this is something called zoning. I just showed you a lymph, no oh, sorry, the splenic follicle, and this sort of recapitulates that follicle involvement of the of the bone marrow, and it has been shown that if you find this zoning phenomena, they are always nodular or interstitial involvement of the bone marrow, and this has been associated <coughs> very highly with involvement by splenic marginal zone lymphoma, unlike again hairy cell leukemia, which is diffuse. Uh, so time-wise, I'm doing okay? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. Well, we have another topic to come. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'll just quickly skip uh, some of the things. Uh, just to just kind of putting all these things together. I'm not talking about hairy cell variant. I think it will expand the topic too much. But note that hairy cell leukemia variant is not a hairy cell leukemia at all. So it's just a name. I've been stuck with it. It's nothing to do with hairy cell leukemia. It just has a morphological resemblance to it. But the markers are separate. And uh, it presents differently, and it has got more immature cells. It presents actually with high count, okay? So it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, and it's never BRAF positive. Okay, uh, mantis cell lymphoma can present peripheral blood. Again, it's a lymphoma, you know, probably not deal much with it, but you know that there's a translocation 1114. You can always order it. Cycling D1 is another way you can diagnose this. So I uh, kind of summarize this. I can go over the notes, which you will receive, inshallah, later on. And uh, this kind of puts all the highlights together for you. So move on to the T-cell leukemias. These are much, much common, much, much less common than the B-cell. Uh, we just said it's less than 10%. Uh, but uh, they can be problematic. If you don't know, you probably have a hard time figuring them out. So know some of the important ones. That's, I have tried to, you know, sort of put them together for you. Um, so they are rarer, as I said, they, they affect adults, but have wide age range. I mean, typically most of these mature lymphomas, you know, involving peripheral blood are adults rather than children. So lots of uh, variation in symptoms, and but there are some important tips from the CBC, you know, clinical way we can figure them out. And this is a list I think you should know and you probably will come across during your practice. Uh, LGL, <coughs> TLGL. Then there's the T, T pro lymphocytic leukemia, TPLL, which is way too more common than a BPLL. Cesare syndrome associated with mycosis or without mycosis. And then adult T cell leukemia lymphoma. And the last one, we haven't seen a case here. It's kind of associated with HTLV virus. And it is, you know, more common in certain endemic areas like Caribbean, in Japan, you know, Far East. Um, we have tested a lot of cases, you know, supposedly we thought this might be the diagnosis, but never ever have we seen a case of adult T cell leukemia lymphoma here in Saudi Arabia. And this is this nutshell, putting everything together for you. Uh, again, you'll see them in the notes. Uh, I'll just go briefly over some of these. Uh, so uh, TLGL are probably the most common of these, and you probably see some cases, if not like many. and. Uh, uh, LGL, large granular lymphocytes, these are cytotoxic by nature because they have the granules. When you talk about granules, these granules actually have cytotoxic granules inside them made for killing viruses and foreign you know, bacteria. And these are uh, CD, express CD57, apparently not, not all T cells express CD57. TIA is a is, is a uh, cytotoxic granule, which is positive in, the, in these cases. So not, these are not the only markers, but these are kind of something which we always use to diagnose them. Most of them are alpha, beta, but some could be gamma, delta as well. 
And to prove that this is not a viral associated post transplant or just, you know, reactive, or, you know, LGL proliferation or expansion, which happens quite a lot actually, and we have seen many in our uh, practice, you have to do clonality studies at TCR receptor, gene arrangement for beta and gamma are key to con conclusively say this is the LGL leukemia. Again, it doesn't mean that you made a diagnosis of leukemia and it's it's not too bad because a lot of these cases actually are behaving or behave insidious and they don't have really a sort of a aggressive course that other T cell leukemias or lymphomas have. This is the sort of a classic case with a lot of these granules and this is the one which are positive for the TI and other granules. <coughs> and immunophenotypically, the key thing to remember is the CD8 positivity of CD3 expressing cells. Now, if these are CD3 negative, they can still express CD8, but then those become NK cells. They're not anymore T cells. So CD3 surface expression is the key to identifying them. And they also express CD57, and uh, they will lose some of the other panty seal markers like CD5 in this case and CD7. So this is all this together is called aberrant marker expression. Again, don't go towards the colors. Just remember the ones which are kind of highlighted for you. So this is the aberrant marker expression of a, of a, of a suppressor or you can see cytotoxic T cells is the key uh, identifying in context of the morphology I showed you and some clinical information. Uh, okay, so this is TIA, which is the granules which are positive in these cases. So the clinical picture in these cases is going to be presentation with low counts you know, neutropenia uh, of unknown cause. Uh, there's some sort of uh, loose association with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other uh, autoimmune disorders. Plus, the patient could also have um, just a presentation of uh, red cell aplasia, nothing more. So when you have something like that in an adult, you would just start investigating for TLGLs. Um, that would be a sort of uh, first thing you're going to do is just look at the peripheral smear and look, at, look for those cells and you don't really need bone marrow to make a diagnosis. Bone marrow is again to see, you know, involvement, but just order a peripheral blood flow and that should clinch the diagnosis. There are other ways of doing clonality by peripheral blood, uh, we beta repertoire we can do, but in this case, if it's ideal, yes, you take the sample and send it for T cell receptor gene arrangement if you're making the diagnosis first time. Um, this is the it's a very interesting condition because I think a lot of you probably haven't seen it, but something, if you make a diagnosis, you can really help the clinical colleague because one thing is very good about this condition that it is presenting as a very high white cell count. It's something like 100,000. And they're all lymphocytes and they look bizarre. They look abnormal. Then you uh, look at flow pattern. This is also abnormal. It's either CD4 or some, some of the cases are lacking both CD3 and CD, or oh, sorry, having a dual expression of CD4 and CD8, which is also abnormal. And you see something like this, and you don't know what, the, what what's going on. You could think of B cell, but again, all the B cell markers are negative. So you're now in a T cell territory, then conditions come to your mind, cesarean and other things, but this is just too much count, right? So this is when you have cells which are bizarre, high count in an adult, usually with splenomegaly, and then helper phenotype without the you know, markers of Cesare syndrome, you should think of TAPLL. But there are various ways to confirm this diagnosis, and so one of them, uh, this is the, is, is the presence of inversion, six, inversion 14, which is involving the uh, locus for the uh, T cell leukemia, TC, TCL, TCL1 uh, is, the, is the locus for that, and that is characteristically abnormal in these cases, and uh, you can always send uh, karyotype. Also, there's a marker for TCL available. You can just order it. The key thing, as I said, you can help the clinical colleague is by making the diagnosis because these cases are uniquely uh, and very strongly responsive to Campath, so which is the alemtuzumab, NTC52, and uh, just disappears the disease. If you give these patients Campath, they have a strong and nice response. So uh, just saying, T cell leukemia involving peripheral blood is not enough. So if you make a correct call, so that will make a good sort of uh, impact and will help the patient and, and uh, your colleagues. 
Uh, the condition which you see here is uh, Cesare syndrome involving the peripheral blood. It can be direct involvement uh, with the patient having erythroderma, then having a peripheral blood involvement, or it could be going through the stages of mycosis, fungoides, you know, multiple sort of uh, years of involvement, and finally goes to Cesare syndrome. There's no difference. The diagnosis is the same. Just in the first case, we call it primary. The second is secondary. And the markers are very, very easy to, uh, you know, it's by, by phenotype. This is, this is the morphology, which is very, very easy. You have seen a lot of uh, these cases with cerebriform, convoluted nuclear morphology. And phenotype is CD3 lacking CD7 <coughs> and helper phenotype. And you can use other markers, but typically these are negative for CD25, which against uh, a diagnosis of a HTLV associated T cell leukemia lymphoma. And they are also negative for CD26. Okay, uh, I'm not going to talk again. I have put this because for completion of this, because they, they, they are not common in Saudi, but they're quite common in other places, and so we should know about them. And perchance we might, you know, come across a case here. So HTLV associated. The most important thing you need to remember is that these express the intra uh, interleukin two receptor. On their surface which is cd25 so that's to be done um, sort of by default in this case without that you cannot make the diagnosis and you can also order htlv serological testing for the virus which is very similar to hiv the same family that's a little different and uh, but it's done in king face also uh, it's not so uncommon and then and the manifestations are very vari variable but peripheral blood is very characteristic we have these clover leaf type of morphology with folded and flower pattern of the nuclei again summing up all of this for you okay so we are to the second part of our talk i'm going to have to rush again uh, i'm going to the plasma cell neoplasms and i'm going to present some classification a little bit morphology talk about amgas then uh, solitary plasma cytomas and maybe a little bit about amyloidosis at the end. <coughs> um, this is again uh, things which are going to be involving uh, the involving plasma cells, which includes the typical myeloma, mon MGAS, plasma cytoma. And then there are some things which you may not directly come across, but because of uh, the plasma cells being the central sort of uh, character in these immunoglobin deposition diseases, primary amyloidosis <coughs> and POM syndrome which is associated with uh, neurological uh, manifestations. So this chart kind of sums it up for you. The AMGAS is the commonest type of monoclonal gamma pathy you will ever see in your practice. And uh, multiple myeloma is next, then amyloidosis, Wardenstrom's macroglobinemia, and then a lot of uh, non hodgkin lymphoma and uh, also CLL can present with uh, monoclonal gamma pathies. So don't forget them. Criteria are very straightforward in the WHO. We have to find an M protein. Level is not important. Bone marrow clonal. Again, level is not important, but people say 10%, but just live, live with that. If sometimes you find some 8%, then patient has fractures and joint involved and bony lesions. It's myeloma. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's 8% or 7%. So uh, most important is the end organ damage. You have to have those or some form of it um, and I have uh, this you probably all know CRAB is the acronym for this which stands for hypercalcemia or renal insufficiency or renal failure of some sort anemia and bone lesions important is to differentiate these three entities and uh, so multiple myeloma the correct name of WHO is uh, plasma cell myeloma but it's interchangeable and this is symptomatic multiple myeloma or uh, small, sorry, smoldering multiple myeloma and asymptomatic or multiple myeloma amygdala. And uh, here the percentages can be very helpful. Less than 10%, more than 10%, M spike, less than 3 grams, more than 3 grams. Okay, so this, this is helping. But both of them, the amgas as well as smoldering myeloma, do not have uh, end organ damage involvement, whereas myeloma has. This is the key difference. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, how do we um, evaluate a case? We obviously, we do all the workup. Most of you already have seen lots of cases. Uh, for the junior guys, it's serum and urine protein electrophoresis. And we do something uh, called immunofixation to confirm which light chain or which heavy chain it is. 
and FLC is the newest but really important and helpful tool now. Uh, radiological skeletal survey and bone marrow examination is the last. You don't start with bone marrow, by the way. So bone marrow is just to complete the workup. It's probably the end of all the sort of evaluation process. And these are lytic lesions, typical case of myeloma, and uh, this is the uh, M spike, gamma region. We have a big spike, and if you do, this is the immunofixation, which you do, this is the control for you, and IgG positive, and kappa, so IgG kappa peak. And this is kind of an older gel type of uh, graph, but nowadays we do uh, capillary zone electrophoresis, which is much better, uh, quicker, and gives nice graphs. I don't have a picture for you now. Uh, FLC and uh, the free light chain is becoming really important uh, ma mainly not to diagnose but to basically to sort of help in difficult cases and also as a monitoring tool of early uh, recurrences and relapses of myeloma. Okay, so clinically uh, if, you, if you get a case, typical case, you will see a rouleau formation. You might uh, have some plasma cells circulating in the peripheral blood. Again, doesn't mean it's Plasma cell leukemia, you need to 20% or more, or 2,000 2, absolute count of plasma cells and normal plasma cells in the peripheral blood. Oh. End up running out of voice a bit. Absence <laughs> of myeloma. Okay, so clinically, uh, uh, if, you, if you get a case, typical case, you will see a rouleau formation. And you might uh, have some plasma cells circulating in the peripheral blood. Again, doesn't mean it's just plasma cell leukemia, you need to 20% or more or 2,000 two, two absolute count of plasma cells and normal plasma cells in the peripheral blood. Okay. End up running out of voice a bit. <laughs> okay, uh, now we, this morphology, I think this is some of something you have seen 100 times, the senior guys. For juniors, this is what, how the myeloma looks like. Blue cells and with this type of chromatin pattern and then some of them have still some leftover halos around the nuclei. And, but that's something very typical, but you can end up with a case which is bizarre and may kind of uh, overshadow the typical plasma cell appearances that you are used to seeing. And these are some of them. You see the bizarreness about them and this sometimes get called a typical myeloma, anaplastic myeloma, it's various names, but end result is the same thing as myeloma doesn't seem to have any prognostic value it's just a recognition you might miss them that's the important thing just know that myeloma can have various phases and this is one of them and this is the immunoglobulin granules or inclusions because you know they sometimes have grapes sometimes have you know we get various names for them garlands and ribbons and stuff like that so this is one one of that and here the myeloma cells are really uh, blasty so again should not take you away from diagnosing myeloma in a given case you have to consider the variants and the variations in the morphology. And for bone marrow, uh, uh, because of uh, the blueness, uh, that's due to the immunoglobulins, which are more, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, acidic. So they would basically stain sort of more reddish in the H&E sections. That's how the plasma cells will look like. And the pattern of involvement, unlike the CLL, is no prognostic value, but again, you could describe them as interstitial, diffuse, nodular, mixed. So, so this is kind of, uh, again, for recognition, doesn't really have much value. Uh, so immunohistochemistry uh, can be done and actually should be done in difficult cases. And flow cytometry nowadays has become really important because of the role of flow uh, that's supposed to play in I minimum mean, residual disease. As you know, myeloma used to be a, a killer disease some time ago, but now because of the improved survival and many patients surviving many years, uh, we now are looking at something called at least uh, presumptive cure, or sorry, cure about these patients. So for that, all these, you know, cure leukemias, ALL, CLL have MRD assessment to, uh, you know, make sure that disease doesn't come out, come back early. So for that, we're looking at something like MRD for myeloma by flow. And it's a, a sort of a, a thing which we haven't really established in our lab, but I think uh, the, things, the way things are moving right now, we'll very soon have to start with doing MRD for myelomas. But there are some problems with the flow. 
Uh, but immunohistochemistry, chemistry, first of all, actually is very uh, helpful and not only in diagnosing in a sort of a smaller number of myeloma cases, but actually in giving you an estimate because what has happened, myeloma is a very patchy disease, so you aspirate may show you like small number of plasma cells, but when you look at the bone marrow, you have sheets and you know clusters of plasma cells. And then to make them really clear for you, you could do some markers, and one of them is the kappa lambda light chains and CD38138, which will give you a correct estimate of the involvement, and that is how that has some prognostic value. Uh, dual staining uh, is something has uh, come out lately, so we can do, uh, this is a case of reactive, so you spell error here, a reactive myeloma in which kappa is stained brown and lambda is stained red. So it's quite neat, so you can, you know, with a sort of single look in the scope, you can say, oh, this is, this is not multiple myeloma, this is reactive because you can see the distribution is very nice. And this has come out lately uh, as, as a good marker and uh, we're going to have it in our lab very soon as well. And there are lots of markers in immunophenotypically that have been used to prognosticate. This is more for not rather diagnosis but prognosis, this is especially CD117, uh, CD56. We are actually doing a project with the uh, clinical colleagues about the role of CD56 uh, in response to Valcade in case of myeloma. So this, uh, these things, cycling D, even all of them have some prognostic in, uh, information. And there are some other markers like CD27, CD81, and few others which have had been used both for MRD and prognostic information. Uh, so, but the problem with, uh, th uh, by the way, this is just a given case of multiple myeloma, uh, sorry, um, normal plasma cells in which, which express CD19 and bright CD38. Bright means they're really touching that line here and CD20 negative and they are polytypic, very beautifully demonstrated by this histogram from uh, Dr. Croft's uh, collection. And uh, if you look at uh, the my plasma, plasma cell myeloma, on the other hand, bright CD38 lacking CD19, expressing uh, no CD19, 56 positive, and only kappa. I had surface is kind of weak, but if you do intracellular cytoplasmic, they're really strong. So this is a typically a myeloma, but uh, as all the other markers that I mentioned, those are done more for prognosis and uh, the MRD. Uh, finally, there are uh, lots of issues about flow. It has not been really <coughs> uh, streamlined in routine practice for uh, diagnosis and pro prognostication as well as MRD. The problems are basically the uh, discrepancy between what you see in the peripheral, uh, sorry, in the in the aspirate and the bone marrow. And when the flow is done, you only have a very small number of myeloma cells that are positive. The reason is uh, I listed them here: hemodilution. Uh, there is differential distribution of plasma cells. In the, so. What it means is basically uh, the particles, the plasma cells tend to associate with the particles or around the particles, but when you do flow, you actually sieve out the particles, you pass them through a mesh, so the particles are left behind, so you don't, you don't be able to do flow with a particle, right? You have to make a single cell preparation. So you're kind of s sort of um, uh, basically separating those particles or you know making them single cell, which kind of, that's where the plasma cells lose out. And that's the whole processing also, which we includes multiple centrifuges, may result in loss of plasma cells. But that doesn't mean that flow cannot be done or cannot be adequately performed. There are ways and means of uh, overcoming these and uh, just have to work on the technical aspects and then flow could be more useful and uh, more conclusive. Um, and as I mentioned, flow cytometry, I think I try to emphasize here the role of flow cytometry as a MRD. That's kind of the key thing I think you guys need to take home message has been now emphasized, especially after transplant. And I get the cases like in this study in which post-transplant 100 day, uh, they found that a flow was positive and there was a difference of the progression-free survival and overall survival, which was statistically significant. Um, genetics in myeloma is another important topic. Again, we have um, probably done it a few times, but I just want to kind of brush it up for you in this few slides that uh, if you do just karyotype, which is probably difficult in myelomas because plasma cells don't divide, uh, the yield is very low, but the, if you do fish, I mean, you uh, just probe for certain certain defects or genetic lesions, then it's very high and got as high as 90%. 
in my analysis, if, if fish is done, uh, we, we have enough markers, all the myelomuscles will have some fish defect or, or a genetic defect. So it's not that we, we, we don't have, we, we kind of uh, not seeing some defects is because we don't have the markers or tools for them. But essentially, if you do properly, we should, we should find defects in all the myelomas. Um, they can be divided, the defects, the chromosomal defects can be divided into two types, hyperdiploid, and these are the odd number chromosomes, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 15, 19, 21. So you leave out what uh, 1, which has got its own prognostic value, 1P and 1Q loss is nowadays considered very strong prognostic. Then you leave out 13, which also has its own prognostic value, and you leave out 17, also has a prognostic value. So all of the odd number chromosomes can be multiple copies can be present, and this is uh, as, as high as 60%. Uh, the rest of them have, don't have hyperdiploidy, but they have translocations, and that's where we have to do these probing and for looking for different lesions, and uh, I'll, I'll list it, them for you here. The cyclin D1 group, uh, which constitutes 18%, uh, MAF group and MM set FGF, uh, FGFR3. Uh, so what happens is uh, there is translocation which involves immunoglobin heavy chain, uh, invariably in 40% case of plasma cell myeloma. But uh, it seems that eventually it some, somehow ends up with cyclin D1 or D2s. So cyclins are seem to be play the key role in almost all translocation myelomas, even non-translocation myelomas, by the way. Uh, so even the MAF group have, have transcription factors for them are the cyclin D1. So it seems that indirectly cyclin D1 seem to play an uh, important role for the pathogenesis. Cyclins rather than D1, D2, so cyclin groups. And the important ones to remember for you is 11, Q2, 11, uh, cyclin D1, association of uh, 16, 14, 16, and this one, 416. Okay. Okay, this is the, the stratification that's proposed by the Mayo group. And I think I would recommend for you to remember it. It keeps changing, by the way. So if you read another journal, you might find different, you know, groups. But Mayo group, I, I believe, has got the best study sets, data, and uh, tools to do it. So I'm kind of more inclined to accept this as the risk stratification for the myelomas and in which 17P is universally in all groups have agreed is the poor outcome one and so is 1416. The 414 has sort of trend to being called high risk a lot of a lot of um, studies but Mayo group puts it at intermediate risk. You will see that 13Q is missing here because according to Mayo group 13Q doesn't have any prognostic value when you're using bortezomib or Valcade, so it kind of loses its value. And they have shown many papers ha are out there which kind of uh, reflect to that. Uh, fish uh, can be done. Uh, we can do a break apart probe by looking for the immunoglobin heavy chain involvement and then screening for, I mean, screening for heavy chain involvement and then looking for the specific targets uh, rather than just fish for everything. So this is how, uh, you know, then we initially use a break apart probe, but this one is the confirmation probe for the uh, uh, 1114 in which this is a dual fusion and it confers 1114. So when 1114, you have a myeloma, it's a good outcome myeloma. So that's the news. MGUS, you already know it's a, it's a pre-neoplastic precursor lesion for myeloma and uh, high incidence, it's quite common after age of 50, around 3 to 4 percent, that's a lot of people. Uh, a lot of them do not progress to myeloma. It's actually a very small minority which go on to become multiple myeloma or or uh, Waldenstrom's. Um, so the diagnostic criteria I think I already touched before. Uh, there are two types: IgM, MGUS, and uh, non-IgM, which includes IgG most commonly. Uh, but uh, when it's IgM or MGUS, it can progress to Waldenstrom's, and when it's Ig. G or other types, which will go on to become myeloma later on. Um, so uh, this is interesting study again from Mayo Clinic. They found that uh, if uh, you you'd study the MGUS is over like say 22 to 39 years period, which is a long long interval, they found that you can divide these cases into four groups. There is no substantial increase in the uh, M, M protein uh, monoclonal peaks in. And monoclonal proteins in 6%. So for 22 and 39 years, they just stay stable. 
whereas 10% uh, will have increase uh, but no myeloma, whereas 57% they die of unrelated causes. So this may be a lot of other things we don't know much about. But then there's a 27% which develop myeloma or microglobinemia, amyloidosis or related conditions. So it's a really small number of uh, progression over a long period of study. So which cases actually would become myeloma? This is really interesting and I think a lot of studies about it. Uh, it's not really clear, but uh, what we know is that uh, the uh, size of the M protein, the type of M protein is critical and not mentioned here, the uh, FLC levels and the DNA ploidy, all of them can be predictive of progression to myeloma. So there is some people, maybe German groups, they, ref they kind of uh, argue that uh, patients who have these risk factors or can progress to myeloma, you should presumptively be treated. But I think majority of people don't agree till we get symptomatic myeloma. Even asymptomatic myeloma, you don't treat till the patient becomes, you know, has some end organ damage features. Uh, again shows uh, you know atypical plasma cells uh, or flow abnormalities at diagnosis of MGUS versus uh, not ones the ones which have are do worse um, same cytogenetics as seen in myeloma can be seen in MGUS so there's not really much difference again uh, you can just go over them in your notes I think I already discussed this quickly we go over to plasma cytosis the last few slides uh, plasma cytoma can be solitary plasma cytoma bone and extra osseous. Extra osseous means it does not involve the bone, it involves soft tissues, it can involve anything other than a bone. Solitary plasma cytoma, um, it's localized commonest, commonest site you probably know is, is the vertebra and it presents just as a lytic lesion and without any bone marrow involvement but it can have amgus, I'm sorry, uh, it can have amgus or it can have actually uh, any M protein but that doesn't kind of make it myeloma it's just only the single lesion that's the key thing here and most of the times they do very well they can be curated out the radiation can be given and really they need chemotherapy um, so they constitute three to five percent of plasma cells uh, neoplasms spine is the commonest 50% have absolute uh, so it's uh, so not all of cases actually have protein. so 50% have M protein serum or urine and important to know is that they need to be followed up closely because a lot of them will progress to frank myeloma later on. The extra osseous common sites are head and neck, tongue, nose, I've seen some of them and they can mimic like uh, carcinomas, melanomas in those areas so we have to be careful not to miss extra osseous plasma cytoma just that it's not a bone doesn't mean that not involved um, plasma cells should not be you know put in the differential. Other sites are lymph nodes and there it can be pretty problematic because then you have to you know, consider other lymphomas which will have plasma cytoid appearance. And again, um, there's this uncommon sites, this library glands, thyroid, breast, GI, and CNS. Um, again, they can have low, low levels of M protein. Um, so most of the time it is IgA and 15% of them progress to multiple myeloma. Uh, very important is the differential diagnosis of especially marginal zone lymphoma, LPL, which is the Waldenstrom's counterpart of the lymph node, and immunoblastic large lymphoma, and even sometimes plasmoblastic lymphoma. Okay, so I'll have to skip because I think my time is running out. Yeah, um, I think the last few slides are related to amyloidosis. Of, I mean, if I were you, I would just read the last, I think this last two chapters, or one chapter of, of uh, Wintrop, which I think is very precise it's really uh, you know deals with this topic really nicely uh, that I think you don't probably see amyloidosis but I think this is something which should be covered and this is uh, the, my last slide just for the especially for the newcomers I would like to uh, reflect on what my personal choices are about the books and this is what I think I like Ventrop a lot it is really a good book excellent you should try to read it through and through you know five years start early you will go far Start reading at fourth year, just don't think of <laughs> completing in one volume. So uh, skip the transfusion part. There's no need to read transfusion from, from the uh, intro. You can just do the just this, uh, introductory chapter. And everything else is really good in Wintrop. I think it's a really good book. And there's a new edition which has come out. There's an actually an atlas besides the book. 
which is really good figures. It has also has a CD or a DVD, which you can use uh, for presentations. You know, present you know for like figures and presentations. It really has good good uh, resource for, to keep. And I don't have the new edition, but try to get a new one if you have a chance. WHO book still good. New York edition hasn't come out. They say it's 2015. We don't know, but 2008 is good enough. I think it's really really condensed knowledge, so should stick to it. Uh, this book I like again. It's a practical. I'm, I'm biased towards American books. Doesn't mean that you know you shouldn't read Hoffman. Those probably are good books too. I just said these are my personal choices. Uh, Kathy Fukar, uh, I know her personally. She's very uh, talented. She, she has edited this book. There are many authors in this ASCP two-volume version, and I only think it's it's not really so updated now. So maybe, uh, but it does cover the practical part, the processes, the techniques, the procedures really well. And I think that for that I'll keep it. And uh, so is uh, Daisy and Lewis, which is another really nice resource for tests for practical purposes. Hemoglobin empathy is the workup of uh, which today um, Abdurrahman gave a nice presentation of hemolytic anemia. A nice uh, sort of stepwise workup of hemolytic anemia is given in Daisy and always studied it for that. So is Coombs positive, Coombs negative. It's really nicely given. And I think, I don't know if the new edition has any changes, but uh, I have always kept Daisy with me. Ash book, I mean, there's no way getting away from it. You have to have it, and it updates. Uh, what happens is Ash every year, and updates topics, but doesn't update everything, because uh, there's so much in hematology. So uh, so you'll have to go between two years, last two years, and uh, one thing is good for you, hematology, that you don't have to study lymphoma. So a lot of lymphoma things you can skip. And uh, for, for, uh, for my him sort of residents, I think transplant also, you don't need to kind of study that sort of from the ASH book. But there are other topics in ASH books. Uh, I was just talking about the CLL and BCR receptor. I think all of you should know about that because that's the future of treatment with the targeted therapy. You do know what are they targeting at. So, so that you need to understand the basics. And that's nice, nicely captured by the ASH book in uh, 2013. Um, any questions and uh, any other Thank you, suggestions? Thank you, sir. Any question? Any question? Uh, thank you, Dr. Bakshi, for this nice presentation. Uh, I, I'm just having a question about a case I uh, came across uh, uh, six weeks back. Uh, she was uh, a lady in her uh, late 40s. Uh, peripheral blood uh, <coughs> reveals like 27% uh, um, uh, plasma cells. Okay. Um, uh, she, uh, the lady was medically free. And uh, her uh, uh, CBC was normal except for these uh, plasma cells. Uh, X-ray was done for the lady and uh, uh, it showed um, sclerotic lesions that are, uh, were not specific for multiple myeloma. Uh, her viral screen was all negative and uh, uh, her protein electrophoresis was normal. The plasma cells in perfect blood? Yes. I see. Were they abnormal plasma cells? Uh, I mean, how you could figure out whether they are atypical? I mean, I didn't they show much about the atyp Sorry? Uh, there were some atypical. Oh, I mean, I would just flow that. I mean, that would be my uh, recommendation, just to flow and see if they have the... You can distinguish easily by flow. This is a plasma cell reactive population. This is, you know, neoplastic by both the abnormal marker expression, also by light chain, you know. Um, but having just plasma cells in the peripheral blood without anything else is quite uncommon as a manifestation of myeloma or Waldenstrom's microglobinemia. Typically, by the time they come to peripheral blood, uh, they're gone, you know, everywhere else, right? So it's plasma cell leukemia uh, usually has a very uh, aggressive course. They come with splenomegaly, you know, aggressive disease, bone marrow involvement, downhill course, poor response. Uh, if it turns out to be plasma leukemia, I think that may be just an accidental first discovery 
what else can you say? But uh, I think the most important thing is to rule out that this is not just a reactive population. Oh, plasma cytoid cells, you know, going to the peripheral blood, which could look like, you know, plasma cells. And sometimes you have plasma cells, frank plasma cells also in peripheral blood that can happen in immune activation, HCV, you know, something, uh, Sjogren syndrome, but you know, like 25-7% is a little too high. I don't know. What else? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, Thank you, Dr. Nasser. Uh, everybody know we use the immunofixation to, uh, to quantify the size of monoclonal protein, but in recent paper for International Myeloma Group, I came across through new technique, or I don't know if it's new, but a new terminology for me. Call, they are recommending for IgA myeloma to use nephlometry. What is nephlometry? Yeah, this is nephlometry is the way actually we quantitate. Uh, there are two ways. There's turbidometry and nephlometry. Okay, nephlometry is the better one. You know, it's just the more sensitive. Um, both have the same principle: antigen antibody reacts, and that increases the turbidity the solution. Nephilometry is actually more sensitive. It is very similar to colorometry. Okay. Okay. Colorometry means that it's very sensitive. It picks up any uh, like aggregation or something. You know, here it's antigen antibody reaction. Uh, it's just the same thing. That nephilometry is what we use actually currently for FLC, free light chains, right? But they, they say that nephilometry should be done even for, that's what you're saying, right? Even for the, uh, for the estimation, yeah. So we normally do by turbidometry, which is a sort of a cruder test. But I think maybe for better uh, estimation or better quantification, nephilometry may, that's what they seem to suggest. Which, which where was this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it's not a new technique. It's neph nephilometry has been done for ages. It's not a new technique. It's, it's something that's a little more sensitive than turbidometry. Okay, it's quantification just. It's not working, can you just give the mic? No, okay, just. <laughs> you can come here. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nasser. Uh, actually, Regarding the CLL, it's well known that at the genetic level, it has been divided to two types, a mutated versus a mutated. Yeah. But we cannot predict for that uh, by morphology and by uh, immune phenotyping. So my question is, what is the recent update regarding the normal counterpart of, 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 of CLL? I mean, the cell of origin of, of CLL. Do we have two population of cells? and? The, the, the another question is, do we have normal B cells, both germinal, which is positive for CD4, uh, CD5, I mean? Yeah, so, <clears throat> yes, there, there, uh, first, the last part is that, yes, we have a small number of CD5 positive B cells have been identified. So you would not make a diagnosis of CLL like there are 2% CD5 positive cells, but then, as I said, you don't just use CD5 co-expression on its own to make a call for CLL. You will look at light chain restriction. You will look at 23. You look at other things, you know, DIM, 20. And all these things have to be taken together. So flow is, as I said, it's like studying the patterns rather than looking at one marker, yes or no. This is not like that. Yes, they, are, they have been described. And uh, you have to be aware of it that there is something like a normally... Uh, CD5 positive B cells, but they are not neoplastic, just reactive, and children can have such things. Uh, I, whether there are two cells or one cell, I think that debate has been already uh, fixed long time ago. It's just one cell. <laughs> Previously, it was thought that this is a naive B cell coming from peripheral blood, hasn't yet matured through the germinal center and come out like through the somatic mutation. And the other was that post post germinal center that's the second one which is the one they say but actually that's that's not right it's just one cell and the origin of the cell actually is in the lymph node it 
comes in the lymphoid cell, lymphoid tissue, maybe rather saying the lymph node could be spleen also. So the origin of the cell is the proliferation zones, the proliferation zones of the uh, lympho lymphoid tissue. That's where they come. They come to the peripheral blood, they go back. This is a recircular. It's a very nice paper again in ASH 2012 by Hillman or uh, Somebody, you know, Spielman, I think he's the one who writes a lot of CLL. Very nice. It explains the, the pathway, how it comes back and goes to the germinal center and stays quiet there, comes out, proliferates, goes back, stays quiet. And this, this is now known the way it's been. The underlying pathogenesis of it is, is, is the uh, microRNA. We talked about microRNA is uh, destabilized, it's deleted, and this was actually the first discovery of microRNA ever in a disease. And they identified when we always knew that deletion 13 was happening in CLL. But what was actually, what is deleted there? Nobody knew it. So, a group in uh, Ohio State, they kind of worked on it, and they actually were clearly figured out. It was published in New England Journal again that it is the microRNA which would act as a tumor suppressor gene that is deleted in it and that results in the expansion and proliferation. Immunoglobulin heavy chain uh, variable region gene mutation normally happens in the germinal center. This is part of increasing the antigen repertoire for the lymphocytes. This is a normal process, okay? So the ones which have gone through that process, they have been have somatic gene, uh, somatic mutation, hypermutation have taken place. They, it seems that they are more stable cells, you know, kind of, you know, they stay sort of quieter, whereas the ones which haven't gone through that process, they are somehow unstable, and that's where the difference comes. But cells is the same. Okay, that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Sir.